Mr. Secretary, it looks like we're good to go and the floor is yours. Okay, Laura, thanks very much. Um, and uh, thanks to everybody who's uh, joining us today. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm here to uh, report that we are still on schedule for reopening the Brent Spence Bridge next week. Uh, the original schedule we set for December the 23rd and we are still on that schedule. Uh, of course, it's been an extraordinary effort by all of our partners in this project, beginning with the first responders, the inspectors, the engineers, the laboratory technicians, and then the contractor, uh, Kokosing Construction Company. And I especially want to acknowledge and thank their employees. And I especially too want to acknowledge and thank all the members of the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet who have been involved in this project. Um, and it would be remiss of me, of course, not to acknowledge and thank the leadership of our governor. I talked to him routinely on this project. He's been up to date on this uh, as much as he's been focused on the pandemic. He's been extremely focused on this project as well. So thank you, Governor Bashir. Much has been accomplished since our update from last week. And what I want to do today is uh, actually update you from that period to where we are today. I'm also going to share with you some maintenance projects, share with you some maintenance projects that, we're actually, that we are able to undertake while the bridge repair is underway. So more on that in just a minute. Uh, but let's start with this week. Um, What's been going on this week? The work that's been going on this week. Um, the last of the new concrete has been poured on the upper deck, the top level of the bridge, the southbound lanes of the bridge. Uh, <clears throat> this is both the deck material, the deck concrete, which is what you see here, and the barrier walls on both sides of the bridge deck itself. So here you see the pouring and the placement of the concrete on the upper deck. On Sunday, the construction crews removed the plastic and the burlap, which is also shown here, which have covered the concrete on the top level or the upper deck. Now that covering simply, that burlap and that plastic simply are there in order to help us maintain the desired temperature for the concrete to cure and to gain strength. This is a very conventional approach for winter concrete placement for winter construction. Now, Monday, just Monday of this week, was spent placing the reinforcing material, the, re the rebar for short, for the upper deck, for the upper deck barrier wall. That is, again, the side walls, the protective side walls on the bridge. Plus, you also see on this. In this picture, you see a uh, electrical conduit for the wiring for the lighting on the, on in, that's uh, embedded in the barrier walls. Also on Monday, construction crews on the lower deck finished the milling or the removing of the top few inches of concrete from the road surface so that they can replace it with a fresh layer of concrete. Now, you'll remember that the lower deck did not receive the same damage as the upper deck. And that's simply that the fire was burning upwards and that's where most of the damage of course then occurred. So the repairs on the lower deck are not nearly as extensive as they were for the upper deck. On Tuesday, yesterday, the new barrier wall, the side walls was poured on the upper deck and crews continued preparing the lower driving surface using a process called hydro demolition, which is basically a high pressure, high pressure water treatment for removing the damaged concrete. And this process removes any loose material, dust and debris, and provides a uniform surface that we can bond the new concrete to. So the last concrete pour is actually scheduled to be poured this Friday on the lower deck. And even with the forecasted winter weather, the contractors have put plans in place to create an appropriate environment for the concrete to cure and to harden. 
Okay, now let's talk about the additional maintenance work that is also underway. I mentioned earlier, we're taking advantage of this opportunity to get some other maintenance work done while there's no traffic on the bridge. One job that's been badly needed for some time has been the cleaning of the overhead signs on the lower level. And you can imagine how dirty they get over time. And so we're taking this time uh, to avoid the disruption that it would otherwise cause, cause to uh, clean these signs. So I really wanna thank everyone who's uh, been involved in that activity as well. We're also taking advantage of the closure to do, to do some repaving on the northbound bridge approach. And just this week, the contractor completed the repaving and the rumble strips and the striping uh, for, those, for that bridge approach. We've also done some drainage work, some repairs there, which required some new concrete and it is gaining strength. It's curing and gaining strength, strength today as we speak. All in all, this has been another good week, another very productive week. I've already uh, praised uh, everyone involved in the project. I just wanna punctuate that. I wanna repeat it because there really has been extraordinary, extraordinary cooperation, extraordinary teamwork. You know, people here recognize that there's no I in teamwork and that has been demonstrated and illustrated all along the way on this project. I think I already praised the contractor's employees and the employees of the, uh, of the cabinet who have been on site uh, literally 24 seven. Now there's a good deal of some fine detail work that needs to be done in the next few days before we reopen the bridge to traffic. We'll be putting down a fresh lane striping and we, there, are, we'll, there will be multiple inspections still both of the construction and of the bridge itself. That's occurring in the next uh, several days. I said from the beginning, I said from the beginning that there would be no cutting corners on this project. Those were clear instructions from the governor, clear instructions from me. And you know, the good news about this project was those instructions didn't really need to be given because the people on this project knew that that's exactly the way this project would be planned and executed. The folks on this project knew that we had to repair the we need to had to repair the bridge and bring it back to a condition which was safe and sturdy and solid. And that is exactly what has been done. So let me remind everyone that you can keep up with the progress of the project and the latest traffic information online at brentspencerepair.com. Be sure to follow also our KYTC District 6 Facebook and Twitter pages. So, okay, with that, Laura, I'll turn it over to you and we'll take any questions. Okay, great. Also, excuse me, just one, I also wanna say that, that I have the, uh, uh, with me today, as usual, uh, have the project manager, Stacy Hands, and the chief district engineer for District 6, uh, Bob Yeager, with me today. The veterans. Okay, Laura, thanks. Okay, fantastic. Um, our first question is um, from James Pilcher. And before I uh, turn on his microphone, I just want to remind everybody that if you have a question, you can either type it into the Q&A um, uh, function that's located at the bottom of your screen, or you can raise your hand and we will uh, allow you to um, speak when it's your turn to talk. And um, James, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and, sorry, there we go. <laughs> you should be good to talk now. Thank you. Good afternoon, Secretary. Two quick questions. One, what is the status of the accident investigation and two, previously you had said you were going to pursue uh, possible uh, insurance avenues to get compensated from the trucking companies. Where does that stand? Uh, has any negligence been discovered in the investigation? And do you have any grounds to go after the insurance companies? Well, I think, Jim, that I answered this before and I'll answer it the same way. It's still premature to draw any conclusions uh, on the uh, inspection 
uh, on the accident uh, investigation itself. And um, in terms of in terms of insurance and claims, we we will exhaust any uh, means that we have, of course, to uh, find any remedies associated with uh, any insurance claims. But that's not yet determined. Uh, those investigations are still underway. Okay, great. Next, we have David Winter from Local 12. And I apologize, I hit the wrong button. Um, David, you should be able to speak now. All right, you're able to hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, yes. great. Uh, Secretary, uh, thanks for uh, allowing me to ask the question. So what has been done or what is going to be done to keep this kind of thing from happening in the future? Yeah, David, I think I've said uh, on a number of occasions uh, that the, the truck that, it, that caught fire was allowed to be on the bridge. Uh, the amount of material, the potassium hydroxide on the truck was a modest amount and it did not require hazardous material placards. Now, that having been said, uh, I believe in continuous improvement and so does everyone else. And there have been conversations already between uh, Ohio Department of Transportation and Kentucky Department of Transportation to examine what might be done in order to, of course, uh, discourage and prevent anything like this happening Again, we would all prefer that, and we all want to do all we can to prevent it. So my comment from the beginning was, we're seeking continuous improvement. Uh, we have asked for any effort to, that can be taken, to be taken in planning for any adjustments that might be made. But it's, it's at this point in time, it's still premature to suggest any, uh, any changes that might be or adjustments that might be made. Um, if I could, are you still able to hear me? Yes, sir. I've got to follow up on that question then uh, because one would have to, uh, you, you've had several weeks. Um, I mean, is this, are, are we going to form a study group? And then, you know, do, it just seems like it begs the question, Secretary, someone must have come, I mean, lowered the speed limit, divert the truck traffic, um, you know, th there's got to be some initial thoughts there other than it's still too early to tell. Well, David, I said earlier that the truck that was on the bridge was allowed to be on the bridge. Now, that's by law. So any improvements that can be made are being examined. It's at this time premature to say what any adjustments that might be made will be made. Okay, great. Our next um, speaker is Trevor Peters. Hi, Secretary. Uh, two quick questions. First, um, you said that you're still on schedule for reopening next week. Is it possible the bridge could be open prior to the 23rd, maybe a day or two before? And then also, we're curious about your thoughts on President-elect Biden's pick for Transportation Secretary. And since Pete Buttigieg is from the Midwest, does that give you hope that an ultimate bridge replacement project could come soon? So the first question, I'll take that one. Uh, we are very optimistic that we are on schedule and I wanna leave it at that at this point in time. Um, there are still a number of things that of course have to be done to complete the project, to button it up. And we're taking advantage of this time for the maintenance work that I described as well. So I'm not gonna predict that we're going to uh, accelerate the uh, deadline or the uh, 23rd at all at this point in time. We've said from the beginning, the governor said that it would be a, 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 a welcome uh, holiday and Christmas present to get this bridge restored in record time. I mean, um, I'm, still, I'm still 
want to say how proud I am of all the people that have done this project, have engaged this project in really remarkable time with remarkable results. Okay, and in terms of uh, uh, Pete's appointment, um, I was fortunate that I was mayor at the same time of Lexington, Kentucky, when Pete Buttigieg was mayor of South Bend and I got to know him. And I don't think that uh, President Biden could ma have made a better appointment. This is someone who understands the dynamics of cities and of the challenges of the transportation that is uh, associated with cities and not just cities, but our rural parts of our country because Pete's from, you know, from South Bend is not an enormously large city. So he's very familiar with the rural and the urban parts of our country, which gives him a real advantage and a, and a leg up in the role that he's got. Uh, I'm expecting as are others that he will focus on infrastructure and um, I'm very hopeful that we'll have, um, we'll have an infrastructure, we'll have infrastructure bill and legislation that will give all of us um, the needed lift that we need in our aging infrastructure across the country. Thank you. Uh, next we have T Tana Weingardner from, excuse me, WVXU. Hi, thank you. Um, so you're not going to say for sure you think he's going to give us the bridge? Uh, I'll, just, I'll just start with that just to follow up. I think we have, yeah, you know, I actually forgot that, we got, that that was part of the question. Uh, I think, uh, let me, let me put it this way. I've said that I'm optimistic. Uh, this is a, this is going to be a transportation secretary who will do his best to help all parts of the country. And my hope is that it'll be Northern Kentucky and, and Cincinnati region as well. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah. And then um, I just wanted to ask, last week you talked about um, the plan is being built for how the bridge will be reopened. Can you just sort of give us a little insight, like practically for drivers, what's, what is it gonna look like? Are you gonna like open this thing maybe at two in the morning? Are people gonna kind of queue up at wherever it's blocked off right now to be able to go across? What might this look like in terms of physically reopening it for people? You know what, this is, a, this is the time when I'm gonna turn it over to the veteran. I said earlier that uh, Bob Yeager is here and uh, he and Stacy Hands, who have been the project manager they are on top of this traffic management project as well. So uh, Bob, why don't you come over and uh, join me? Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for that $64,000 question. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, action and opportunity for us to do uh, exactly what, uh, what we wanna do to open up traffic again. The first thing we wanna do is we wanna make sure we do it safely. And the second thing we do, we wanna do it as soon as we possibly can. Um, there are two things when I say that. Um, right now, we have about eight miles of uh, traffic control uh, along the I-75 corridor, and that's just in Northern Kentucky. Uh, Cincinnati also has a number of ramps and different things that are closed. Uh, once we get the, uh, the okay that everything is, is out of the way, all the equipment's out of the way, everything's being done, uh, we, uh, we plan, to, uh, plan to open it up uh, one lane at a time, which is how we do uh, every operation. We'll start from the, uh, from the beginning of the closure and then work our way back until finally everything's gone. So, so traffic will sort of filter through. Uh, we really don't want to, we don't want to you know, do the uh, checkered flag kind of thing and get everybody going through at the same time. So the idea would be that uh, it will eventually go through and traffic will filter out. Ideally, if we, had, if we could pick a, a particular time, it would be in a, in a non, at least the, the non, non times of, of the heaviest traffic control early, very early morning or very, early evening when, uh, when you have the greatest amount of traffic there. But again, we'll work through that as we know, as we get closer to the uh, time that we know we're gonna have that. And we'll make sure that that information gets out to, uh, to everybody in appropriate time. Uh, we really, really don't want people standing there waiting for us to un unopen the, uh, or, or pull the barrels out of the way so they can be the first ones across. But in the same sense, we do wanna get it open so we can get, the, get traffic back to as normal as we can. Thank you. Next, we have Tom Latek from Kentucky Today. Thank you. Hello once again, Jim. Hope you're doing hey, well. Tom. Yes, sir. 
um, yes, to yes, kind yes, of yes. follow, first of all, to follow up on that other thing, you know, the people waited in line and uh, to get on the Sherman Minton. Remember when it closed there a few years ago between uh, Louisville and uh, Southern Indiana. Uh, so you're not going to do something like that, I guess. Um, well, no, right. Well, I don't think. We... So. Okay. Yeah. Not, under, not under the conditions we got these days. Yeah, right. Okay. What are we looking at in the way of costs now? Uh, have, have you gotten any more firm numbers beyond the 3.1 million you spoke about last time? Yeah, that was the, that was the uh, actual cost for the uh, Kokosing contract, which represented the, uh, the real heavy lift and the significant portion of the project. Um, we received, I think, Tom, as you know, received what amounted to a down payment uh, in, uh, in the ER or emergency relief funds or a quick release portion. And that was $12 million. Now, we have been extraordinarily efficient in this project in order to achieve quality results and safe results. We have been extraordinarily efficient. And from the beginning, our objective was to do just that. Quality, safe, and efficient. And I don't want to be premature. I've said this many times, don't want to claim victory prematurely, but we have a good sense now of the costs. We know that we will be below the quick release numbers of $12 million. Oh. And how much? Still don't know, but I'll promise you that as soon as we do, uh, I'm sure you'll ask us and we will have that information for you, Tom. Thanks a lot. Yes, sir. I will say, you know, um, I've been around a lot of construction projects and I, over my career, and um, I can, I can, without any reservation, say that this has been one of the most efficiently and effectively managed projects. It brought together an remarkable team of people under extremely adverse conditions to get the job done efficiently and quickly and safely. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have um, another question from Marcus Green and Marcus, I'm allowing you to talk now. If you'll share your affiliation before answering your question, that would be great, thank you. Are you there, Marcus? Marcus, can you speak now? Sorry, my computer froze. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear okay. you. Uh, Secretary Gray, I'm, I'm curious what your level of optimism is for any kind of infrastructure, gas tax, road fund modernization bill in the upcoming session, and how do you plan to uh, be involved in, in those discussions? Well, Marcus, good question. Uh, as you know, there has been a very low uh, level of funding for the last five years. Uh, we are down, uh, in Kentucky, we are down almost a billion dollars over the last five years from funding that preceded 2015. So since 2015, we're down almost a billion dollars, $200 million a year. And that's had a really, really destructive uh, impact. And I won't say disastrous impact, but it has really presented problems for the cabinet. Now I've been on this, I've been on this job now for a year and I come into a, a role like this reflectively and wanting to listen. And I learned quickly of the distress that we're experiencing all across the state. Uh, the Brent Spence um, is symptomatic of these problems that we're having with our infrastructure, but we've got these problems all across our state. So I'm, I, have, uh, I know that what the governor has said in a leadership role is that he would be, he would be supportive of a revenue enhancement that would be fair, that would be bipartisan and with no strings attached. And I think that's, um, I think that's the kind of leadership 
uh, on an issue like this that we all deserve. Uh, but it's going to take a bipartisan effort on the part of uh, the legislature and everyone coming together in order to support a pro uh, this needed relief and enhancement that uh, we need. You know, um, I learned also in this job that the most the most important road in the state is coming out of your driveway and going left or right down the road for a mile. And that's what we're talking about where we have such problems today. We have problems in our rural areas. We have problems in our urban areas because we simply do not have the funding today to, um, to implement it, the kind of improvements and infrastructure improvements that we need and, and that we deserve. If I can just follow up, are you optimistic that that could be achieved in this upcoming short session, especially given some of the other priorities that the Republicans have said they want to pursue? Well, there's been a lot of support on the part of uh, many members of the legislature. Uh, I, I know that the Kentucky Association of County Officials, uh, KCO, and uh, uh, the League of Cities uh, all have all have indicated their support and there have been resolutions from counties indicating support. So the good news is that there does seem to be um, the kind of support that we need. Of course, you know, we also recognize that these are really tough times, really tough times. So getting to the point, uh, any legislative, any legislative body has to come to a point where they recognize that um, I learned this in a job of being mayor that you're going to have people that are going to disagree occasionally, uh, but at the end of the day, when they see the need, then they will do the right thing. That's what I believe. Thank you. Our next question is from Pornima Apt. You should be able to- Hi, Secretary that. Gray. Um, this is Pranima Apte. I'm actually with the American Society of Civil Engineers. Um, and I was actually calling to see what your biggest challenges were in, time, in terms of the engineering challenges, especially given the pandemic and the, and the seasonal you know, headaches that were involved. You mean for this project? For the repair yes, project? Yes, for this project. Well, yes. I would, <clears throat> I would characterize it as the, um, the extraordinarily quick turnaround that was needed, that was required in order, to, in order to develop the engineering for the repairs to at first uh, diagnose the problem in a sense, if we were looking at it clinically. Um, and so the inspectors had to determine uh, what kind of damage, the extent of the damage to the bridge. And that took as many as 20 inspectors, three days. And then the inspectors, it, they had to take that data, that information, and the engineers led by Michael Baker International, the engineering firms that were assigned to the project, that were engaged in the project, they had to do the engineering for the repair work. Then with that scope, the contractors were able to put together their quantity estimates, their quantity survey, and their pricing to do the repair work. Uh, also involved bringing in, <clears throat> bringing in and sourcing, or sourcing and bringing in new stringer beams, the beams that support the upper deck. So all of this together mm -hmm. represented a, a significant challenge for the engineers. And so for your colleagues in the, uh, in your, <clears throat> in the professional, in the professional association, you know, I just want to say uh, we commend all of those who are involved in this project, both internally in the, in the transportation cabinet, U.S. Department of Transportation, uh, support from Ohio Department of Transportation, and the contractor, the consulting engineers that uh, we had on board with the project. Did I forget anybody, Bob? Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I, I had one. I had one follow-up question, if you don't mind. Um, uh, you know, did the pandemic complicate the response in any way, or, 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 or was that a non-issue in your case for the repairs? You know, I'm going to give a bit of a, a bit of a, um, 
a reflective answer on that. Um, I have observed many times in this project in the last 30 to 40 days, how uh, extremely collaborative the team, the management team has been at every level, okay? And I would suggest that the efficiency in managing this project was actually enhanced to some extent by the technologies that we are using today to collaboratively manage, just like we're doing right now on this call. And that's been occurring um, at seven o'clock almost every night with the most senior management team in the Kentucky Department of Transportation. But the same sort of collaborative decision-making and management is occurring at all levels of the project, engineers, inspectors, the contractors, all of <clears throat> the first responders, everyone that has enga been engaged in this project has been able to work collaboratively. And some of that has been as a, as a function in my view of the technologies that we have, as a result of the pandemic, we have had to adapt to and adjust to. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Pornima. Um, we have a couple questions in our Q and A screen, and the first one is from an, an anonymous attendee, and is asking, "What are the financial impacts of not building a new bridge?" Well, um, I can tell you what the financial impacts of the of the Brent Spence Bridge today are, uh, and this is well known. I think you can Google it in Wikipedia and find it. The Brent Spence Bridge today, uh, what the <clears throat> the traffic that's carried over it, um, the commercial traffic carried over the Brent Spence is estimated to be 3% of the U.S. gross domestic product. Now, what's that? U.S. gross domestic product today is about $21 trillion. So if you do the numbers on it, 3% of 21 is around six to $700 billion a year. That's a big number. So if it is not functioning efficiently, and it's certainly not today, it's <clears throat> certainly not functioning efficiently. Now, if it's not functioning efficiently, then we are losing in terms of its economic potential and value. Thank you. Um, David Winter from Local 12 had one um, additional question and he wanted to know if anyone is tracking the number of accidents that have been caused by the rerouting of traffic due to the closure, um, i.e. on uh, 275 um, to 471. I'm gonna let Bob Yeager speak to that. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, uh, we, uh, since we're not having very many accidents on, on the Interstate uh, 75 uh, proper, um, some of those accidents would have occurred other places. Uh, obviously, when there's heavier congestion, it causes us more. Um, we do get the reports, um, but they're not instantaneous, um, so that those things will be grouped together, and we'll be able to look at that once uh, once we finish this. We'll be able to measure uh, what accidents, uh, what additional accidents have been caused. We, we found though that uh, uh, even though with less traffic, uh, traffic accidents in general, even before this this uh, crash happened, uh, traffic accidents were up. And that should have been counterproductive because traffic is slightly down. Um, so there are, there are a number of variables in there we'll have to consider when we, when we start weighing uh, if, uh, if these uh, detours have, uh, have been a cause of uh, additional accidents. Um, again, it'll, be, uh, it'll probably be at least a month after the, after the bridge opens back up completely that we can start comparing those numbers. Thank you. Great, and Mr. Winter looks like he had a follow-up question, so I'm going to um, allow him to speak. Before David does that, I was gonna say, I wanna just uh, supplement what Bob said. I think it's, uh, we need to praise the driving public uh, for the patience that they have exhibited during the course of this project. I think that's really important. We ask for that patience, and in my view, that request was delivered on, thank you. Secretary, uh, and I'm not sure if this is for you or for Bob, okay. but I literally just got off the phone because I had made a request uh, of the different police departments that are 
um, in the area of the 471 transition from the 275. Um, and I literally just got off the phone with the chief of the Highland Heights Police Department. He said that last year there were two accidents at that interchange of the 275 to the 471. This year, there were 36 during that same period of time between the Brent Spence closing down and now. Two accidents last year, 36 this year. Was enough done to remediate the potential for accidents in the alternative routes? Two accidents to 36 seem yeah, well, they, yeah. As you and I both know that uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna let Bob speak, but first I'm gonna be I'm gonna offer a I'm gonna offer my own comments. Uh, these were extremely adverse conditions, extremely adverse, and the traffic management challenge has been e extreme as well. 160,000 or more uh, vehicles diverted every day. So um, I've said in in I've said earlier that we're always about continuous improvement, always about learning from uh, experiences, and we'll do that. But I will absolutely stand by the management of the project at every level, including the traffic management. Now, I'm going to let Bob speak now. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, I, and I'm, sure there, I'm sure there are more accidents. Um, when, you, when you do a comparison just based on days, I'd have to look at the, what the weather was uh, during that time. You know, there's a, there, there are some other incidents there. Uh, there's no question the congestion was a lot higher and, uh, and people were, are, are uh, not, uh, uh, if you know what those accidents are, um, they're not basically from the road, they're from the, from the drivers. Uh, we've, we saw that early on uh, with, a, with a number of uh, incidents that were happening there. Um, and uh, we made some, made some changes to that. I would hope that those helped uh, we put up additional signing. Uh, we asked people to get into the left lane earlier so they weren't trying to squeeze in um, through there. Uh, it, it, in order for us to really do a, a, an in-depth uh, uh, avenue of this, we'll have to look at the, exactly what, what caused those accidents and see if the patterns are there. Um, certainly it was because there's more traffic and, and we're always gonna have that. Um, uh, it, I can't believe that, that there was only two last year. And that's a, that's a pinch point that we have. And, and uh, we've looked at trying to do a number of things there. Um, I wish I could widen that bridge um, so we could get two lanes across there. Um, but we looked at a number of uh, another alternates and, and there's no short-term answers um, short of uh, not allowing people to make that turn. And, and of course that would mean everybody would have to go 275 and, and that's not conducive either. We did put up signs if you've been through that area, uh, encouraging uh, drivers to stay on 275 if they were gonna utilize I-71 and uh, in, in Ohio, um, it was only a couple of minutes longer and we saw some benefit to that, um, but it was certainly still not enough. But yeah, you're right, that's, uh, that's more accidents than any of us would like to see in a short period of time. Um, we just not have gotten into uh, why, that, why that's uh, occurred just yet, other than the obvious with it being more congestion, a lot more vehicles. That is the um, extent of our questions today. Okay. And I'm sorry, um, one other question just popped up. Um, let's, we'll have this question and then um, believe that is it for today. This is from Steve Hensley. Oh. Good afternoon, Secretary. How are you today? Mr. Steve Hensley, Mr. Director, how are you today? Doing fine, sir. And uh, as you alluded to uh, earlier, uh, we're benefiting from the technology that, uh, that we're utilizing. I could not join you today in our emergency operations center. However, uh, I felt like I'd be remiss that if I didn't express our appreciation to you and your team, certainly Bob that's sitting there next to you, he's available to us 24 uh, seven. The communications coordination, um, it, it's just unprecedented throughout this, this entire project. And as Kitten County's Director of Homeland Security and Emergency Management just wanted to take the time to express our appreciation to you for your efforts and, and facilitating this. It, uh, from my opinion, it couldn't have gone any better. 
Well, hey, uh, Steve, thanks very much. Uh, appreciate that. And uh, I'll just say back at you, we really appreciated everything that you guys did, uh, really from the very outset, uh, giving us the Emergency Operations Center to, to, uh, to be our headquarters for the Transportation Cabinet when we needed it. Uh, we really appreciated that. And all the first responders, um, y'all just, it was, you had an extraordinary, num uh, extraordinary people and extraordinary commitment and passion for their job and to get things done safely and to get things done as efficiently as we as they could. So thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. And the yeah. residents of Kitten County and the traveling public here yes. are commended for their patience as well. Yeah. Thank you, Judge, too. And yeah, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. All right. I think that's it, Laura. Yes, we are good. All right. Thank you all so much. If anybody's still on, appreciate it. Thank you all.